Ah, good morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections today. We have a wonderful day in store for us. And first up is a VIP from Belgium, from Brussels, I assume, Henri Vantigen, who is a consul general uh, in L.A. for the Kingdom of Brussels. Belgium. Belgium, I'm sorry, <laughs> Kingdom of Belgium. And uh, welcome to the show, Henri. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am very honored to uh, address to the uh, Hawaiian audience. And uh, I hope that it will uh, generate some sympathy uh, among the people for, for Belgium. Uh, Belgium is the country, Brussels is the city. Yes, thank you. It's the you. capital city. And Brussels is very famous, actually more famous than Belgium, because it's the seat of uh, international organization like NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is the large alliance between European countries, uh, Canada and uh, United States of America and also the seat of the uh, European institutions. So we can say that uh, it's the capital of the European Union. And it was a commercial capital for a long time, don't you think? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, from the Middle Age, uh, Belgium was a crossing point for a different civilization, and we have a city called Bruges, uh, 65 miles from, from Brussels, northward from Brussels, and this city was uh, in the 10th, 11th, 12th century, a huge economic uh, uh, crossing point, and we can say that if we have to compare that with the situation of today, Bruges in the 10th, 11th century was the New York Stock Exchange of the world. <laughs> <laughs> now it's an absolutely beautiful town. Yep. It's, it's so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful cities in all of Europe. So uh, I shouldn't say city, it's really a town. Yeah, <clears throat> true. If you ever get a chance to go to Bruges or Brugge in Flemish, yeah. huh, uh, you must go. Speaking of which, Flemish is your second language. Huh? What is that? Well, actually, in my situation, it is my first uh, native language. But, uh, and then I studied in French. So I am bilingual uh, for Flemish language. That is uh, spoken by 60% of the population in Belgium. 60%? 60%, northward of Belgium. It's the northern part, called Flanders. Also a very famous historic name, Flanders Fields, you know. Uh -huh, uh, sure, yes. The, the poem in the uh, First World War. Uh, Flanders Field is in, actually in Belgium. And uh, the southern part of Belgium, with the Ardennes, and a city that is also very well known in the United States, Bastogne. Yes. Uh, there, the people speak French. Yes. Very interesting place. I've been there and I certainly enjoyed it and I, and I, I felt that history all around me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in the 20th century, Belgium was um, kind of a target in both world wars and took a lot of uh, damage and, uh, and fatality. Can you talk about that a little? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, uh, when we became an independent state in 1830, well, the name of Belgium exists since Julius Caesar. He mentioned the Belgian tribes uh, at this time, at the time of Christ, actually, uh, in, in history. But uh, we had not an independent country up to 1830. And in 1830, all the European powers, France, Germany, Austria, and of course the British Empire, they decided to, create, to accept a new country called Belgium, at the condition it would remain neutral. It would not join an alliance and it would be uh, independent from all the different uh, countries without influence of these countries inside. It gives us a large freedom, especially an economic freedom, because we could develop our economy without influence of Germany or France. And we were extremely successful at that time in the, the first years of capitalism, the industrialist revolution. Belgium was actually the second country to follow the British Empire um, and England at that time. And it makes you progressive, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. But then this neutrality was indeed respected by our neighbors up to 1914. And in 1914, at the beginning of the First World War, the Germans wanted to attack France. And the best way to attack France is pass through a flat country, a flat country where you can dispose of your army wherever you want, and without that much resistance, because uh, Belgium is still a small country. We had a great army, fantastic uh, private soldiers, but still uh, facing the German army, it was very difficult to resist. We had to withdraw, and the battlefield was on our territory because the French on the other side, they enter into Belgium and they face the German army. They had also to withdraw up to the Battle of the Marne, the Marne River, in uh, September 1914. Ah, uh, yes. Wasn't that where the French came in taxicabs? Correct, from uh, Paris. From Paris, Absolutely. yes. 
Absolutely. Yes. They, they had reinforcement from the uh, Paris uh, garrison that was sent to the front line on the Marne River by the taxis. <laughs> it didn't work. Well, yes, because the German was stopped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the German was stopped. And that's why, actually, in the Second World War as well, we had battlefields in Belgium because we are a very, very uh, usable country, usable battlefield between France and Germany. And that's a bit... Uh, the way that we could solve the problem is to create the European community at the first time and now the European Union. So that today, a war between France, Germany or England even with Brexit, is unthinkable. Mutual defense. Yes, we are all together and we have a, a single economy, a single free trade area you can export to the different countries without any obstacles. There is a, a total freedom of uh, moving for the people. They can move from Belgium to Italy. No or borders from, at all. No borders inside the territory of the European it's Union. It's very important to Belgium. Absolutely. In Belgium is actually a beneficiary at least as much as it is a contributor in, in terms of mutual defense. Yeah. True, true, true. And then we have uh, near this uh, great family of uh, European countries, we have NATO that bind, binds us with United States and Canada. And that is very important also for our security because uh, the European Union is not at the primary uh, face uh, um, a defense organization, but it's an organization that wants to promote peace and collaboration and exchange of uh, ideas in between the member states. And of course, it, pay, it, passes through, it passes through economy. And Brussels is the capital of the EU, isn't it? Yes, because the institutions are seated in, in Brussels. Uh, you have, that's why uh, when the uh, President of the United States fly to uh, Europe, its first stop is always Brussels. Not because of Belgium, but because of the international institutions <laughs> right. that are in, uh, set in, uh, setting up in, in yeah, Belgium. All the management, all the staff, yeah, it's yeah, all in yeah, Brussels. It's yeah. all in Brussels. Yeah. You get to, as a consul general, do you get to engage with uh, the EU and NATO at all? Uh, NATO a bit less, because this is really the business of the embassy. Mm -hmm. But uh, as the European Union is an economic uh, organization, uh, we have in all... Uh, the place where we have Consul General, gathering of the EU Consul General of EU ambassadors, when it's uh, for a small country only an embassy. Mm -hmm. uh, every month we have a kind of coordination uh, to exchange view, to exchange uh, uh, numbers of economy and to, to see how we can improve the relations with uh, the host country. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all of Europe has a problem with migrants these days. And it's a sort of two-phase problem. One is they come in uh, for one reason, one rule or another, uh, and they settle in various places for various reasons. And the second problem is that maybe they don't fit so well in some countries, and then you have a, a, a right-wing kind of reaction to that. Um, you know, we know from many shows that that has happened in a number of countries in, uh, in Europe, happening in Brussels, in Belgium. Well, yes, like everywhere else, like in Germany, like in France, like uh, in Italy these last days, and also like in Greece, because Greece is on the, on, would say, on the borderline uh, with, the, with the migrants. But we have to make a difference between refugees and economic migrants. The refugees, of course, have a right to be protected, and uh, in, it is internationally agreed uh, by treaties that we have to protect civilians uh, fleeing their countries because of war, civil war or international war. So this is something that we are facing now with the civil war in Syria, instability in Iraq, and Middle East is actually our backyard. Because when you have the Mediterranean Sea, we have a backyard that is the Middle East. It's very close from Europe. And uh, you have in between a kind of buffer state that is Turkey. And Turkey is very important in accepting, in the first place, uh, refugees from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's all connected. It's all connected. <laughs> but then you cross the border between Turkey and Bulgaria or Greece, and then you are indeed in the European Union. Or you cross the Mediterranean from Libya by boat, and then uh, you are in the European Union. These my economic migrants, the second uh, class of, of migrants, I would say uh, there are procedures to uh, integrate them and to facilitate them in the labor market. But actually, uh, they have no uh, 
per se, they have no right to enter in the European Union. Do they get Union, jobs? Like, and they, we try to, to, to find jobs for them, yes, yeah. indeed. I mean, I, I know refugees very... is a bit different than economic migrants. The refugee, we are bound to accept them and to protect them. The economic migrants, well, they are processed, but if they are showing up at your border, you have to find a solution for them. And of course, sometimes they are repatriated in their own country, their home country, because, uh, well, they don't feel full, fulfill the... Um, conditions to be uh, uh, accepted. Yeah, and this has been happening for a while. I mean, it, you know, we learned about it uh, only a few years ago mm -hmm. with the, all the great numbers of migrants. But in fact, there's been settlement all over Europe, including the UK, uh, by various Muslim groups and African groups, uh, you know, that were seeking a better life. Mm -hmm. And they're there. They're part of the firmament now. Yeah. Uh, so recently you had a, uh, I hate to ask about this because I know it must be painful. You had a terror attack in Brussels airport two years ago. Correct. Um, you know, what was the, the fallout of that? What was the reaction of the, of the Belgian people about that? Well, the uh, first rea reaction of the Belgian people was to share sorrow and to mourn the victims and the families of the victims. Uh, actually, there was no violent reaction toward one or another community. There was just a very sad reaction. But our view against terrorism is also passing through a response uh, via uh, police and justice corporations among the uh, European countries. Among the, all the different European countries, we have to share information between the police service, uh, between justice, the judiciary must yeah. be in contact, and we have to fight the terrorists by uh, legal issues, yeah, yeah. By, uh, in a legal Which point Which is what view. you did in the case of the, the Brussels attack. Correct, right? correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, they were all arrested. Uh, of course, those who blow up, they were killed in the terrorist attack. But all the networks were arrested, and we catch them up, or in France, or in Germany, because they are networked, they have networks. And through this police and justice cooperation, we can crack down their networks. And uh, the attack happened uh, in May 2016. Actually, since May 2016, we do not had any more incidents. The yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then in, in, in France, uh, the same, and in Germany, the same. I think that uh, we reinforce a lot through the uh, mechanism of the European Union. We reinforce the police and justice cooperation in order to have the best uh, share of information before it happens. Yeah. Oh, so much better. Interpol. Huh? Yeah. Interpol. So, um, you know, one of the things, as I look at the... Uh, the well, the actually, Interpol is international, worldwide. We yeah. have no Europol and Eurojust. Ah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. That's better yet, because yeah. it's a limited number of nations. And Absolutely. Comparing notes on a closer basis. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I looked at the uh, newspaper this morning and saw that there was a parade in a secondary city in Belgium uh, involving a float that was arguably, mm. well, more than arguably, it was anti-Semitic. Uh, but you pointed out to me before the show that... Uh, this was not a surprise because that parade in that city has a, has a custom. Can you talk mm -hmm. about it? Well, uh, it's the Carnival. Uh, Carnival is uh, a festival that is happening in different cities in Belgium. Most of the time it's only uh, a festival that is uh, for the people, but here there is a parade, and this parade is mocking uh, almost everything. Uh, the, <laughs> once in a year, on that day, it's called also in Germany uh, uh, the Fool Day or the Fool Tuesday. Uh, it's uh, in Belgium is Carnival, and uh, in this city they mock everything. They mock the the, the government. They mock uh, the police. They mock the migrants. They <laughs> mock also some communities. And unfortunately, because it was very bad taste, and of course it was uh, considered as offensive for a community, but. Uh, I'm sure that it was not meant to be uh, anti-Semitic. Uh -huh. It was just meant to, to have a kind of uh, mockery of different traditions uh, for all communities. It is bad taste, and I think it will change because this year it was uh, indeed uh, broadcast world war, uh, worldwide, this uh, parade, and uh, we had a lot of reactions, and I think next year it will be more <laughs> cool and uh, less offensive. Well, that's Henri Vant again. Um, did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah perfect. <laughs> He's the Consul General of the Kingdom of Belgium uh, in Los Angeles. And we come back, we'll, we'll take a look at uh, the connection between Los Angeles and Hawaii in terms of the, the, the Belgian um, uh, Consul General. And, and we'll look at uh, how Belgium feels about things in the United States. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Abicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. <laughs> hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're honored to have the Consul General of the Kingdom of uh, Belgium, that is Henri Vantigan, here with us in the studio this morning on a given Wednesday. Henri, a kingdom, you know, that little surprised me. Uh, it's a kingdom? Who's the king? How does that work? Well, um, when we got our independence uh, gained uh, by a revolution against the Dutch, we created a state and all the powers, the European powers at that time, the world powers, British Empire, France, Germany, they accepted the Belgian independence under one condition it would be a kingdom. And we said, we were really searching for a candidate, and the best candidate was Leopold of Saxe-Coburg Gotha, and then he was elected by Congress as King of the Belgians. It's not King of Belgium. He's not King of the, the landlord Belgians. of the country, he's the first citizen of uh, the, com the Belgian community. He's and King of, course, of the Belgians. Of course, you have a, a legislature as well, a parliament. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's comparable to the British system. Yeah. Oh, we speaking of which, <clears throat> Brexit. Yeah. Can I get your thoughts on Brexit? You don't well, have to yes. give me the official position, but let me know what you think. Well, I think that we, f we feel that is a very sad issue, the Brexit, because uh, the European Union was stronger with the Brits inside. No, the population in the United Kingdom has decided to leave the European Union, and uh, we are negotiating with them the terms and condition to leave it, for leaving this European Union. Unfortunately, it seems that on the side of the British government, there is still some uncertainty on the conditions. We on the European side, we are uh, very clear and we have put on the table a proposal that has been rejected two times by the British Parliament. But it's supported by the British government. Theresa May has proposed this uh, treaty with the European Union of association. They won't be a full member, but they would be associated. And unfortunately, the, the British uh, House of Commons has rejected uh, the proposal two times, and we hope that there will be maybe some more uh, education about the treaty so that the people would uh, accept it and uh, make some pressure on the parliament to agree with the treaty. If they leave without treaty with the European Union, it will be something terrific, terrible, terrible, because uh, then we, it will be a situation of hard Brexit. With a treaty, it would be a soft Brexit. Without treaty, it would be hard Brexit. And then we will be in the situation that all the ties that are existing with the UK and the continent would be cut. Oh, oh that would be tragic. That would be tragic, absolutely. Would be tragedy, indeed. You know, but uh, it seems that in, in England, that that's what the, per, the press reports, that there are so many different tendencies and so many different trends uh, in the parliament, even in the political parties, Labour Party, Conservative parties, that is very difficult for them to make a common position towards the EU proposal. But at the same time, what is a good news is that the European Union remain very close from each other and we have a common position for the 27 member states remaining in the European Union. So it was said when there was a referendum that European Union might collapse and there might be other countries willing to leave. It is not the case. Oh, good. Those who are remaining want to work together and want to go forward and maybe to progress together. Oh, good, good. I, I, for my sake, I, w I would prefer there'd be no Brexit at all, wouldn't you? Well, uh, a referendum is a referendum, you know. Uh, when the people decide something, you cannot go uh, against the decision of the people. Of, 
Although this kind, this uh, time it was a very small uh, majority. It was 52 percent or something like that yeah. for an issue that is so important than being member of the European political family because it is a, an intergovernmental organization where every government has its word to say. And then we come to a consensus and we can have a European rule, a European legislation, which is very important. But then you ask the people, even with 2%, 2 percent of majority, uh, the people has decided. Yeah. It's, it's a pity. I think there was a, a very difficult uh, issue. It's a very difficult issue to explain to the people because the European Union is still very technocratic. There are a lot of positive things that are coming from the European Union, but uh, it, it is very difficult to explain in simple terms uh, to a people what, is, what are the advantages to be a member of the European Union. On the contrary, it's very easy to ask the people, and at the end of the day, it was almost the question that the, the Brits had to face. Are you, do you feel more British or do you feel more European? And of course, they feel very British. But the, the purpose of the European Union is not to create a new nation. Every single country will remain its own uh, or political organization. There is France, there is Germany, there is Italy. They will remain independent countries. The European Union is not trying to merge everything in a new nation. The great Europeans were great Europeans because they were very deeply French, Germans, Belgian, Dutch or Italians. We do not want to erase the nationalities. The purpose is to, um, I would say, to harmonize the policies, to have a common view on certain issues. A common view is very important because on certain issues we are stronger together. The point of view of France over Germany is very important, but when is a European common view that is agreed not only by France for its own or Germany for its own, but by all European countries from the Atlantic, from Portugal to the Baltic Sea to Finland, all together we have a common position, then we have a lot of weight on the world's affairs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, it's funny that this Brexit thing, I mean, I don't think it was intended this way, but the Brexit thing makes the EU stronger. In a funny way. In the it? cohesion between the remaining countries, indeed. Yeah. indeed. How and about the economics, though? Does it make it stronger in terms of the economics? How is Europe, the EU, uh, how is Belgium doing on, on, um, on the economic side? Well, for the time being, there is a growth in Belgium and all the um, indicators are in green. So we have a, a very flourishing economy. Uh, there are some other countries in the European Union that are in more difficult situation, but when, we, when it comes to the European Union, we can help each other. This is a question also of solidarity. And the great achievement of the European Union is this solidarity among the, the, the European countries. As we told before, there was two world wars started in Europe. No, it's impossible to imagine that there would be a war among these countries, first of all. And we, have, we share so much solidarity and we have the same economy because it's becoming the econo the. Uh, uh, European economy, for instance, for foreign trade, uh, all the different uh, member states of the European Union have transferred their sovereignty to negotiate trade uh, agreements with third parties, third country, to the Commission. So for the European countries, there is no possibility to uh, agree on a free trade area with India or with China without passing through the European Union. So it's very good. So there is the European Union represents all the member states for foreign trade issues and we can negotiate free trade agreement with giants like the United States, like Canada, like China on uh, equality and we can put what uh, we expect from uh, free trade, it means growth and welfare for the people on, on the table as well as the economic uh, point of view and aspect of the treaty. Does that include gas? Does it include LNG? We had a show last week about gas coming from Russia in a new pipeline that bypasses uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. and comes directly to Germany uh, and that, um, you know, countries charge each other for the passage mm -hmm. of gas. Correct. Uh, how does that fit? 
Well, this is not foreign trade, this is uh, uh, energy policy. And for the energy policy, there is no common position from the European Union. Okay. So for this policy, yeah. Germany is suffering to have its uh, supplier for energy. There is no common common policy in energy. We try to, to, to shape it, and step by step we are, we are uh, in a good way to, to, to have this uh, common policy, one more common policy. But it's indeed a part of uh, free trade agreements. Energy policy can be included in free trade agreements with third countries. And so it's, it's indeed something that we can uh, put forward and uh, where we, make, we have to make some progress, mm. indeed. You know, but I'm again, like... the problem is that, you know, it would be very easy to unify Europe with uh, Napoleon, uh, but it is not the purpose. The purpose is to have all the people and all the government and all the state treated equally and then having a coordination on their policy. If possible, an integration of their policy. You know, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to hear you say that. Um, we live in a time when there's sort of, you have not only democracy in individual countries, mm -hmm. growing democracy in individual countries, you have a kind of democracy among the countries. True. Where they collaborate, cooperate, True. talk to each other. True. This is a phenomenal thing in our lifetimes, Henri. Um, but I wonder, as time goes by, what's the trend? Do you think if we look again in 100 years, we should only be here in 100 years? If you, think, if you look again in 100 years, do you think that, that uh, Europe, the EU, will be closer uh, as, a, as, as a unified political entity? Is it possible? I think so. You know, uh, even in the education of a child, you have phases when uh, it goes back, and then it goes forward, and then it goes back. It's some, some kind of process that takes time. And we started with the European Union 70, uh, 55 years ago, and 70 years ago we were at war with each other. So th that's again, we expect to have everything immediately, but politics takes time. Amen and then I think that within 100 years, uh, we will face a totally different world, first of all, and then the European people, and I hope so that the British, they might, they might change their mind about uh, membership of the European Union and come back. It will take time, always. But uh, it will be the case, I hope, that we have a more coherent and uh, a more solidarity among the nations and inside the European Union. You're here. Thank you. So um, I, I promised that we would talk about uh, Belgium's uh, relationship mm -hmm. uh, with Hawaii. And I, I, I tell you that uh, Chaminade University, St. Louis, you know, was created by, uh, by an order of, uh, of friars and brothers uh, from Belgium. Uh, that uh, Father Damien mm -hmm. uh, in Kalapapa uh, with the leprosy community there, mm -hmm. he was Belgium, Belgian. Um, and we have a, a certain history, most of it in the 19th century. Uh, with Belgium. Right now, today, there are cultural elements in this community that are clearly uh, Belgian. Yep. Uh, so your jurisdiction includes Los Angeles, I guess the West Coast, yep. and also Correct. Hawaii. Um, what do you see the relationship as uh, today between Belgium and Hawaii? Well, first of all, uh, the relation started very early after the creation of uh, the Kingdom of Belgium. We started in 1830, and in 1842, we had already diplomatic relations with the Kingdom of Hawaii. Twelve years later. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we had relations with the Kingdom of Hawaii. And uh, from then, we have a representative in Hawaii for the Kingdom of Belgium, an honorary consul. These days, is uh, Mr. Jeff Law, Honorable Jeff Law, who is uh -huh, representing uh -huh. Belgium here. And uh, we are extremely uh, positive toward Hawaii. First of all, the reputation of these islands is the paradise. So everybody loves uh, even the name of Hawaii. <laughs> and then uh, economically, we have some important uh, exchanges, but also culturally. And I think that uh, the, in the education field, we had some uh, missionaries coming from Belgium and establishing some institution in Hawaii. And secondly, we had also uh, Father Damien, who became a saint uh, yes. 10 years ago. Yes. 10 yes. years yes. ago, he's a saint. So he is worshipped in, in Hawaii, but also in Belgium. He's a very famous figure uh, for the Belgians. And uh, he, he helped in Molokai uh, all the leprosy uh, Hill people. And uh, nobody wanted to go to Molokai. And he said, OK, I will go for a few years. He was and he remained, he remained 16 years helping the people there. And uh, uh, he, 
is still very famous. Uh, we have every year in Belgium a Father Damien Week. Was that right? Yes, for collection of um, money, uh, funding for uh, the uh, 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 help for the leprosy and handicapped people. It's a direct connection yeah. with Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I offer that there's a strain in the Belgian culture uh, that is giving and charitable. Uh, Alamosinary. Uh, otherwise, these people would not have come here to build True. educational and health institutions the way they did. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And by the way, uh, in 1881, I think, uh, King Kalawa from Hawaii, he traveled to Europe and he spent one week in Brussels. And he was received by our king at that time, Leopold II, uh, <laughs> with parties and uh, a lot of uh, fun. And he received the highest decoration of the Belgian kingdom. And I think that my king received the highest decoration of the uh, Hawaiian kingdom. <laughs> this was mutual exchanges. And uh, we, are, we are trying to find out for some pieces that are now uh, in display at the uh, Royal Palace if they are coming from Belgium or not. But probably they are coming from Belgium. My feeling is that they are Belgians. Some uh, decoration uh, objects. Well, thank items. you, Henry. Thank you for coming down. I hope you come down again. I hope you come again when you come to Hawaii. And I want to thank Jeff Lau for setting this interview up. This has been great, important to us for sure. Thank you, Henry. Aloha. Hello. Mahalo. Bientôt. <laughs> Bientôt. Thank you. Thank you so much.